What if we put actual lava in a lava lamp? At best, it would melt the whole thing, releasing a toxic gas, and you maybe die. At worst, it interacts with the colored water explosively, and you die. But that answer is totally boring, so let's get deep up in here. The inventor of the lava lamp was a British dude named Edward Craven Walker. Before inventing the lava lamp, he was not only a pilot, but a pilot who fought Nazis in World War II. After the war, he did what all war heroes do. He went nude! Old Eddie went all in and directed a pro-nudist film called Traveling Light. Which sounds hot, but unfortunately the movie had zero conflict, and the plot boiled down to, look how cool it is to be nude! So it didn't really make so much money. Anyway, one day in the mid-1960s, our war hero nudist Edward was drinking a pint in a pub when he noticed an egg timer made of oil and water like a liquid hourglass. Struck with inspiration, he raced home with the idea to create a lamp with globules that rose and sank in a colored fluid. That's right, our boy Eddie was not only a nude pilot, he was an alchemical mad genius. He tinkered for a while, then eventually perfected his formula and filed a patent. And what do you know, he's not only a scientist, but a business guru. He started selling what he called the Astro Lamp, and it was an instant hit. Ringo Starr came into the shop and bought one. It was featured on Doctor Who and other popular shows, and in its colorful, peaceful, trance-inducing glory, it was huge with a certain, uh, long-haired, tie-dye t-shirt crowd? <clears throat> Hippies. <clears throat> and there we have it. The lovely story of a war hero who creates an international sensation all on his own. Now that we know that, let's find out what's inside a lava lamp so we can replicate it with real lava. Edward, can I see that patent? Hey, give me that. What is this? Why is this an American patent? You're British. And this wasn't even filed by you. It was filed by some guy named David George Smith? Edward, have you been lying to me? Bro. So it seems that the story told by Edward's company may not be exactly correct? This is the American patent for the concept behind a lava lamp from 1965, which was filed by David George Smith, who Edward had hired to develop the lamp. But in 1950, 15 years earlier, a patent was filed in the UK for a suspiciously similar concept by a British inventor with tons of patents named Donald Dunnett. And here's a photo from 1960 that shows some of Donald's lamps. From what I can tell, this is approximately what actually happened. Oi, United Kingdom, look at this cool thing I made. Wow, so original. Here's a patent for it. Cheerio! Unfortunate. Oh, how tragic! Hey US, look what I invented. Ah, don't mind him. Sure, whatever. Here you go. Alright! Hang in there, old chum! Edward sold the American rights to his invention to a couple guys from Chicago, who rebranded the product as the Lava Light Lamp. Eventually, Edward's company rebranded their products to be called Lava Lamps 2, because it's way cooler and less disco era sounding than Astro Lamp. So overall, it might sound like Edward is a cheat and a liar who totally sucks, but in my opinion, he's actually awesome. My man fought the Nazis, then thought, you know, life is great, let's all take off our clothes. Then he found an invention that no one was doing anything with, and no one would, because the inventor was super dead, and made it a worldwide fascination. Pretty cool. And it turns out that as soon as Donald died, his wife had gotten rid of most of his inventions, so it was probably nearly impossible to track down his family at the time. I like to imagine that if old Donnie had been alive when Eddie stumbled on his invention, they would have been best pals and taken the world by storm together. Hold on, wait, what are we doing? Oh yeah, we're making a lava lamp out of lava. So, what's inside a lava lamp? In Edward's patent, he describes the liquid on top being dyed water and the globby stuff as being made of wax, oil, dye, and carbon tetrachloride. What, what's carbon tetrachloride? You probably didn't ask. Well, it's a chemical used in tons of stuff in the 60s that was found in the 70s to deplete the ozone layer as well as destroy people's livers, kidneys, and central nervous systems. Very cool stuff. So if you have a lava lamp from the 60s, maybe don't drink it unless you're in the market for a horrible, painful death. Oh good, so it's okay to drink this new lava lamp. Not so fast. Some guy drank one in the 90s thinking it was booze and almost died from kidney failure. No need to thank me for saving your life. It's just what heroes do. They did a toxicology report on that guy in the hospital and found all these chemicals in his body. So these are likely to be found in modern lava lamps. Some of these are mildly dangerous. So even though broken glass is really fun, it's probably not a good idea to smash lava lamps in your house. The way a lava lamp works is that the gooey substance has a higher density than water at room temperature. But when you heat it from the bottom, the gooey stuff expands so that its density is lower than water, so it floats to the top. 
Up there, the temperature is lower since it's far away from the heat source, so it cools, shrinks, and sinks back to the bottom. There are several chemicals in the gooey stuff because it has to have the right densities at the right temperatures, it has to not stick to the walls of the lamp, and it has to look cool as it rises and falls. In order to tweak each of these properties, you would change the ratios of the chemicals in the goo. So let's just start trying stuff. We'll teleport some lava into a lava lamp and see what happens. Ah, shoot. So if lava comes into contact with water, it can explode and also create toxic gas. So let's swap out the glass for a thick layer of diamond, which has a melting point way higher than lava, and will heat up the rock slowly. Next pair, come on over. No? All right, I'll try it. Hmm. So if you heat anything up to the point where rock melts, it'll start glowing. So we won't be able to see anything going on inside because the glowing container is in the way. And even if we ignore that, the lava doesn't float. There just aren't any see-through liquids that are dense enough. No! Wow! No! No! Oh, no! Guys, guys, don't fret. I have a simple solution. We'll just cheat. All I really want is to see glowing globules of lava drifting around. So we'll make a giant glass cylindrical tank. Let's say five meters tall, three meters wide to ensure there's enough water to absorb the heat from the lava. Engineers, build that for me, please. We'll drop loops of lava into the tank from the top. So it doesn't explode and kill everyone, we'll do smallish spherical drops of lava 0.4 meters wide, which is the length of a stoat. Stoat note, look at these little guys. A male is called a Jack and a female is called a Jill. And a group is called a caravan or a gang. And the stoat's little cousin, the least weasel, is the world's smallest carnivore. So if anyone ever calls you a weasel, that's a compliment. Anyway, quartz is cool because it goes through multiple transitions in its journey from lava back down to its rim temperature form, so we'll use that. I wanted to start at the top of the tube as lava, sink, and then drop out the bottom as a huge chunk of solid quartz that you can comfortably touch with your grubby little hands. So let's bring it from 1800 degrees at the top to 30 degrees at the bottom. With some back of the napkin math, the quartz should take about 141 seconds to cool while falling through room temperature water. Uh, oh shoot. Uh, it's gonna need to fall pretty far in that time. Engineers, could you make that tube a little taller for me? It's gonna fall about 760 meters, which is almost as tall as the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa. Cool. And we'll need an observation building to go around it so that people can actually watch the globules fall. Since this will be way up in the air, we'll just not worry about the toxic fumes. We'll put a sign up there for the birds so that they know not to fly over it. This is cool enough that taxpayers will certainly want to pay for it, so here's how expensive it'll be. $720,000 for the glass tube, $5,400 of water, $171 for the glob of quartz, to save money we're gonna get the cheap stuff for quartz, and $83.28 for the electricity to melt the quartz and lift it back up to the top. We're only gonna run it once a day, cause we're not made of cash in this house, alright? Engineers love building stuff like this, so we can estimate the engineering to be free. And to bring the glob from the bottom to the top, let's just say we'll need a tube of aluminum 760 meters tall. And then to account for all the moving parts in the heating mechanism, we'll just round that to a kilometer. So that'll cost about $1.9 million. So here's our cost. Ah, and then I guess we should include the cost of building the skyscraper around the tube. The Burj Khalifa was $1.5 billion to build, but ours is a little shorter, so we'll round that down to a billion. So our total cost to build a real lava lamp and run it for one day is $1,2,625,654.28. Not bad. So in conclusion, can you make a lava lamp out of real lava? No, not really. Anyway, that's it. Bye.